physicists were very unsure whether there were such thing as atoms. They were not at all convinced. Chemists were convinced that atoms existed, but there were plenty of physicists, especially in the German-speaking world, who doubted that atoms existed. And the way the physicists finally caught on was they realized that over and over again, you could take some feature that you observed in the behavior of gases, and you could explain it in terms of atoms. You can explain the temperature of a gas as the average energy of the atoms. You can explain the pressure of the gas as the atoms bouncing off the wall. Boltzmann says, I can even understand the entropy of a gas or anything else in terms of the atoms that make it up. And his definition was simply, I can consider all of the arrangements of the atoms or whatever constituents make up some system, but I don't see those atoms. When I look at the gas in this room or any person on the street, I don't see every individual atom with its location and its velocity through space. I don't see all of the information I would need to use the laws of physics to say what's going to happen next. Instead, I see some macroscopic features. I see some observable things about the system that I'm looking at. So Boltzmann says that to every macroscopic configuration of a system, there might be many, many microscopic arrangements. So here's a picture. This is supposed to be uh, cream and coffee, but I had to use coffee liqueur and white chocolate liqueur because the, it separates better. So this is a liquid version, a liquid alcoholic version of entropy, and you see that in this case, there's a separation between the white stuff and the dark stuff. And if you mix it, you will get a mixture, and that's a very natural thing to have happen. If I showed you a movie going from here to there, you would think that was natural. But I can stir this glass all I want. It is never going to go back that way. That's part of the arrow of time. The entropy has gone up from left to right. Boltzmann says, that's because this is made of atoms, and I can tell the difference between the white chocolate atoms and the coffee atoms. So if I mingle different arrangements of the white chocolate without disturbing the coffee atoms, that's fine, but there are fewer ways to do that when there is this clean delineation between the different liquids than when they are mixed together. Here I can only mix stuff on the top with other stuff on the top, and vice versa with the bottom, but here I can mix anything with anything. So what Boltzmann says is that entropy just counts the number of ways we can arrange the atoms so that you wouldn't notice. You wouldn't be able to tell if I took the atoms in this glass of liquid and moved a couple of atoms around or reversed the momentum or the velocity of all those atoms. You just can't see that macroscopically. So Boltzmann says, here is all the ways we can arrange something. Some are very obvious that they're in a delicate relationship, and those are low entropy. More of them are high entropy. There's more ways to be disordered. There's more ways to be arranged in a high entropy configuration. And if that's true, then it seems very natural that entropy goes up. There aren't that many ways to be low entropy. There are lots of ways to be high entropy. So if you start with a delicate configuration, it's just natural it will go into there, and it's very unnatural to go backwards. There are more ways to be high entropy than to be low entropy. And this picture, by the way, is dramatically unrepresentative of the real relative sizes of these arrangements. The high entropy region is enormously larger than the low entropy region. So really, you could stir this. Statistically speaking, Boltzmann says that if you stir this glass, and you wait long enough, eventually it will go back to that arrangement. The second law is not absolute. But you have to wait much, much longer than the age of the observable universe to get there. So for all intents and purposes, entropy only grows. It's not going to shrink. Now, people were very pleased with that. And in fact, it, it, it depended a lot on what country you were in. We, sometimes we like to think that science is all about ideas. In fact, sometimes what your friends around you are thinking and their other commitments and so forth do matter. So the English loved Boltzmann's ideas, but his, his German and Austrian compatriots poo-pooed him, and he, was, uh, he struggled all his life to try to get his ideas across. The, the nice thing is he explains why if you start with low entropy, you go to high entropy. But it clearly leaves a question to be answered. Why did the thing start low entropy? In this example, the reason why it started low entropy is because I stood there very, very delicately and I arranged it. Okay? Why does an egg turn into an omelet and not into an egg? Because entropy increases. But where did the egg come from? And the answer is it came from a chicken. And that chicken is not a closed system. That chicken has access to a low entropy surroundings around it. So there are explanations for these microscopic, for these specific examples as to why you started low entropy. But what about the universe? Why is the whole entropy of the universe going up? It's easy using Boltzmann's ideas to predict that starting today, the entropy tomorrow will be higher. 
It's impossible, using only Boltzmann's ideas, to understand why the entropy was lower yesterday. Indeed, if you'd used only Boltzmann's techniques, since the microscopic laws of physics are time reversal invariant, you could prove the entropy was higher yesterday, just like you can prove it's higher, going to be higher tomorrow. But that's not true. The reason is that there is something going on at early times. The reason why entropy of the universe, the, order, the disorderliness of the universe, was lower yesterday than it is today is because it was even lower the day before that. And the reason why the entropy was even lower the day before that is because it was even lower the day before that. And this logic goes all the way back to the beginning of the universe. The reason why in our kitchens we have eggs that we can turn into omelets is because the Big Bang had a low entropy. And you're laughing, I hear you laughing, but it's the truth. We are embedded in a larger system, and this is being reflected in our everyday lives, and this leaves us with a mystery. Why did the universe have such a low entropy when it started? So to think about that a little bit, here's a picture of the universe. This is Edwin Hubble. He's looking a little smug, and as well he should. Edwin Hubble discovered the two most important facts about the universe. Number one, it's big, and number two, it's getting bigger. Now you might say, probably someone had guessed that the universe was big even before Edwin Hubble came along. But here is a picture, you can't see it because it's a little bright in here, uh, but here's a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope, named after Hubble. This is the picture that you get if you take a really, really precise telescope up above the atmosphere of the Earth and you point it at an empty region of the sky. The sky was a region where, as far as you know, there's nothing there. And you just let it sit there collecting light for hours and hours and hours. And what you see are all these little blobs. They're very faint, but there's some of them that are quite a, a bit brighter, and, and astronomers 100 years ago certainly knew that they were there. They were annoyances because when you were looking for comets, you kept getting confused because you used to see these little blobs. What were they? And there was a debate that was going on. Some people thought that they were just a cloud of gas here within our galaxy. They knew that there was something called our galaxy, the Milky Way, the collection of stars, 100 billion stars we now know that orbit around each other. So they thought that, well, maybe these are just clouds of gas within our galaxy. Other people thought maybe they're separate galaxies. Maybe everything that we see here is a galaxy just like our own, a collection of its own 100 billion stars. And it was Hubble who answered that question. He showed that things like this, this beautiful spiral, really is a galaxy similar in size to our own. There are 100 billion stars in that galaxy, and there are 100 billion such galaxies in the observable universe. So the universe is getting big. Hubble also showed that it's getting bigger, that it's getting bigger as time goes on. The universe is today pretty darn big, tens of billions of light years across, but you can trace it back. It's expanding right now, which means the different galaxies are moving apart from each other. It does not mean the things that are held together are expanding. So galaxies themselves do not expand. Galaxies that are far apart are expanding because the space in between them is growing. But an individual galaxy is held together by the force of gravity, so it is not expanding with time. Atoms are not expanding with time. You are not expanding with time. Or if you are expanding with time, it is not because of the expansion of the universe. <laughs> there are other answers. But given that the universe is expanding right now, we can play that movie backwards in our minds, and we can say, where did it come from? 14 billion years ago, if you extrapolate backwards using the known laws of physics, everything was on top of everything else. We call that moment the Big Bang. You will hear certain cosmologists talk about the Big Bang as if we know something about it, but we don't. We actually know with very good precision and reliability what the universe was like one second after the Big Bang. But that first second is still a complete mystery, and the first zero seconds is an absolute mystery. We have to keep an open mind about what is going on. As the universe expands, it becomes more dilute, things stretch apart, and photons, the particles of radiation, go from being short wavelength and high energy to long wavelength and low energy. They lose energy. The universe cools off as a function of time. So the future of the universe is that it's going to be increasingly empty, desolate, and cold. That's just what science tells us. We can't really do anything about it. The third important fact about the universe, remember, number one, it was big. Number two, it's getting bigger. Number three, it's getting bigger faster. This was discovered in 1998. There were two groups, including one led by Brian Schmidt here at uh, Mount Stromlo Observatory in Australia, that used supernovae, bright exploding stars, to measure the change in the rate at which the universe is expanding over time. They were really thinking that they were going to find that it was slowing down. 
That just makes sense. If the universe is expanding, there's everything in the universe pulling on everything else. You'd expect that expansion to slow down as a function of time. Instead, what they found is that the universe is accelerating. As things move apart in recent billion years, the universe has started moving apart even faster. If you looked at a galaxy and you took its velocity right now, and you came back a billion years later and took its velocity again, it would be higher when you came back later than it was the first time. Why is this happening? We're not absolutely sure, but we have ideas. We have one very good idea called dark energy. It's simply the idea that empty space has energy, that if you took a little cubic centimeter of space and removed all the stuff, removed all the light, all the matter, all the energy that you could possibly remove from it so it was empty, and you said, how much energy is there in that empty cubic centimeter of space? Einstein tells us that there's no reason for the answer to be zero. The answer is some constant of nature, some number, the intrinsic energy in space itself, sometimes called the vacuum energy or the cosmological constant. Here's a picture that I took of it, but this is a false color picture. It's really black. It's empty space. It's about 10 to the minus 8th ergs per cubic centimeter, if our theories are right. And what that means is, Einstein also told us, that energy helps make the universe expand. It's the amount of energy in the universe that determines how fast it's expanding. At early times, when the universe had a lot of energy in it, it was expanding very fast. You would have expected, as it dilutes away, the expansion slows down. But in fact, this dark energy does not dilute away. It remains 10 to the minus 8th ergs per cubic centimeter, even as space grows. So it builds up. In between you and a galaxy, there's a certain amount of dark energy. But as that galaxy moves further away, there's more and more dark energy. You see the galaxy move away faster and faster. And if that's true, and it remains that way, which is the most likely possibility, but certainly not set in stone, another thing we should keep an open mind about. But the simple idea is that this vacuum energy never goes away. The universe expands. It cools off faster and faster, and pretty soon, cosmologically speaking, we're going to be in an empty, forbidden, forbidding, lonely universe. So that's the universe. I'm sorry to you know, be such a downer about it, but we have a few billion years to go before things get completely empty. So we can tell this story in terms of entropy. We can ask, how does the evolution of the universe relate to the arrow of time that we observe when we break an egg and make scrambled eggs? Well, at early times, the universe was very smooth. We see today in the universe, we see galaxies, we see clusters of galaxies, stars, planets, etc. It's a lumpy universe on small scales. But if we look at sufficiently large scales, if we average out over billions of light years, it begins to look very smooth. And that's because at early times, the universe was extremely smooth at all scales. And it's only on small scales that we've had time to go from this smooth universe to have gravity pull things together and make stars and galaxies. So this is a low entropy configuration. As the universe expands, gravity pulls things together, the contrast knob is turned up on the universe, and the entropy goes up. Now, the entropy is going to continue to go up. That's the second law of thermodynamics. That's going to happen. So in the future, what's going to happen? Everything empties out. So we go from smoothness to lumpiness, and we're going to go back to smoothness again. There's no direct, simple relationship between smoothness and lumpiness and entropy. What there is is the fact that this configuration of stuff in the early universe, there was a lot of stuff. And it was all in one very, very delicate arrangement, so there's the same amount of stuff everywhere. That's a very specific arrangement for the early universe to be in. It has a low entropy. And that entropy increases as you make structure in the universe, and that is reflected in the world we see around us every day.